I'm Mike Scheidrick. My partner is Carlos Mendez. We're interviewing Mr. McCain, a World War II pilot in a B-24. Um, the date is January 10th, 2003. Um, we're going to see what his story is. Just to stop at any. Um, let me first stop. What were you doing before the war? I was in college at Plattsburgh State Teachers College then. And uh, they had a, a program for uh, reservists. You could join a reserve because the draft wasn't lowered to 21. It was only at age 21 then. So that uh, if you went to uh, Plattsburgh, they said that if you join this reserve, there could be the Marines, the Air Force, the Navy, or Army. And uh, that you'd be exempt from the draft when you did reach 21. So, otherwise my father wouldn't have signed for me to go because he was very much against my going and serve, as a lot of fathers would be. And so, but when I went down in December, they had closed the program, so I just enlisted in the Air Force, but I was in college in uh, Plattsburgh, and then I went in service that February. Okay. Um, were many of your friends entering the war? along with you? Or? Oh yes, everybody from, there were about 60 of us in the freshman class and everybody that by the end of the year were all gone and because they joined this reserve program that didn't turn out to be much of a delay mm -hmm. getting you in service. But, uh, so that, yes, just about them. And some could get out of school early instead of waiting to June to graduate they could uh, get them out, say, okay, you're a senior, so this is January, well, maybe by February or March, yeah. we'll give you credit for your senior year, you can enlist. And so many guys are doing that. So in a way, did you kind of get drafted or was it a combination of a drafting and an enlistment? No, I wasn't drafted because uh, the draft wasn't even lowered to 21, I was just mm -hmm. there, turned 18. I was up 18 out of October. And so, uh, when I went down in December down to Albany, that I just said, uh, if the reserve closed, well, I'll just enlist. So I enlisted in the Air Force. Um, what made you enlist? Well, uh, that we knew that the, the war was on, and this was uh, mm -hmm. 42. I graduated high school in 42. And so this was. I turned 18, and the prospect of, go, of flying was, I was interested in that. And of course, everybody wanted to be pilot, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, that, uh, but when they said, well, uh, it's going to be closed, well, it didn't worry me. I said, I'll go anyway, you know, on the list. Were you nervous when you first arrived for your trainings? No. That to me was a big adventure, and when I was going into uh, leaving, I grew up in Chattagay, New York. It's up near the Canadian border, and so the idea I had never been, hadn't even been as far away as Syracuse, you know, as far as I've been as Plattsburgh. So the idea of going someplace was a big adventure to me. So that uh, it was fine with me. I was hoping I'd go to Texas. I said, I hope we'll go to Texas. <laughs> Texas seems a long ways away. So I hope to go there. I went to Atlantic City active for basic training. Um, how extensive was your training? That, well, it was 17 months. Uh, when I went in, you went to with basic was at Atlantic City. And we were there for uh, less than two months. And then they had what they called a, College Training Detachment, CD, uh, CTD, and many colleges around here had a unit, like Hamden College had a unit in the Navy there, uh, Plattsburgh had a unit in the Navy. I went to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and here was the, uh, uh, so I went there, but only again. It was just a place they wanted to get people in the, in the pipeline to be coming air crew. And uh, the idea of, uh, of the college training detachment uh, was 
to get you, you review the things you did in basic training, and you take a test, and if you needed some, I took astronomy and I took uh, some uh, physics, I think, and, uh, but I was only there for uh, two months, and then you go for uh, classification. You take your test, see whether you're going to be pilot, navigator, or bombardier, or not in the air crew, you know. Did you get along with all your drill instructors? Always. You know, I never, I never had anybody over me that was a pain in the neck or I thought was unjust or anything like that. Anybody I ever had, I always thought he was just doing his job. And it seems though that they were all civilians, like in, uh, in pre-flight, I remember the man that we had, and he'd be a second lieutenant or a first lieutenant, and uh, he had been a, a coach. He was a high school coach, and all right, so he went in three months, you get your, uh, you get your, uh, what am I say, your commission. And so, but he was just a very nice guy, you know, so that, and then once we got on the crew, uh, we were the same, the same rank. In other words, a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier were all uh, second lieutenants when he first met. And so that the, the idea of rank or taking orders didn't come up as much as it might be in, say, an in infantry unit or artillery. Did you make many friends at your trip? Oh yes, that uh, there was a lot of very closeness to those the ten guys, and uh, we have continued over the years. Not so much, actually, we didn't have a reunion until about thirty-seven years after we split up, and uh, because you're going to your own work, your own family, and after you get to the close to retirement age, then you start thinking about, well, I wonder whatever happened to so-and-so, you know, who was on the crew. And so, uh, that was about the first, we had about that many years ago, I think about 15, 20 years ago, when we started organizing and having reunions. And uh, now they're about, of the ten, I think there are possibly four or five are still living. And uh, so that, uh, but we're good friends, you know, and the rank didn't make a difference. That the enlisted men were, when we first joined, they were uh, buck sergeants, three stripes, and so that everybody got an additional stripe. Your engineer had, had was a staff to start with when we got on the crew, and he'd become a tech sergeant. Do you know what a tech sergeant stripe looks like? Okay. So that a buck sergeant then was three stripes. Staff had the one rocker underneath, and then a tech had two rockers underneath, so that you had a radio man and the uh, and the engineer and at during uh, combat the, during the tour, everybody went, went up one stripe so that the the engineer and the radio man became tech sergeant all the others when they came back were uh, staff sergeant. And the four officers got a promotion up to first lieutenant. So all of us came back first lieutenants, the four officers. What day were you shipped abroad? We went over in July, and uh, of July of 44. So there was 17 months. And uh, as I wrote, you know, I wrote a, uh, another history of, for the family. And, uh, I gave this to my kids for uh, Christmas, and this is, these are my parents. And the so I did uh, the, the history of the McCanns, our family. Do you know where your family came from? Mm -hmm. Where? Um, Germany. Is that right? Mm -hmm. When? 1940s, I believe. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Right before the war? Yeah. Is that right? That recently? My great-grandfather, I think. Is that right? Yeah, or it may actually have been in the 20s. I'm not positive. Uh -huh. It was before World War II. But before the war. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Is that something? Did they flee Germany with the refugees or no? Just I to don't get think down? so. They just wanted to come to the U.S. Okay. That's interesting. That's interesting. That, um, so my people came in from Ireland 
before the famine. And so that uh, what I did was put together, uh, and the last part is actually three parts, and the third part is how about the famine during the war. And so that uh, I, it's a good chance to review for me, because, you know, okay, mm -hmm. what year did Hitler go into Russia? Sorry? When did Hitler go into Russia? What year? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, anyhow, that's what I couldn't say for sure. That you see, now wait a minute. So, what I, anyhow, so because of that, uh, I wrote, how about the family during the war? You know, he actually went in in 41, June of 41. 1940, he went into, uh, when they took the lowlands in France. He had, a, he had all kinds of success, you know. And we weren't even in the war. When was Pearl Harbor time? Sorry. When, when was Pearl Harbor? When did we go in the war? Mike, you went to it. In uh, what? 1944. was, I think, when Pearl Harbor was, right? Correct? No, in 41. In oh, 41. December 7th, 1941. It was when the, uh, was Pearl Harbor. And so that, that it was, Hitler had gone into Russia before we even got in the war. And he was doing, going great guns. And it looked like he was going to sweep right through. But uh, the isolationism in America was very, very dominant. We said, it's their war, you know. But anyway, so that uh, one of the things that, if I do say a word or two to your class, that'd be one thing I would say, try to get certain dates in your mind that you hang things on, you know. Like, when was the, how about the uh, Civil War? What, what dates for the Civil War? 1960s, or 1860s. <laughs> okay, not bad, you're not bad. You know, 61 to 65, yeah. So that, uh, in other words, I try to hang things before the Civil War, after the Civil War. You know, before World War One, World War One, or after. You know, so that uh, many of the things that we might talk about be good to kind of hang them someplace on a timeline. I'm big on timeline. What was it like when you first arrived overseas? Yes. Uh, it just struck me very funny that as we arrived, went over in July. And I didn't realize it at the time, but we went over as replacements because our group, there were about uh, 45 or 50 aircraft in a uh, group, and we were a group as a 461st bomb group, so our B-24s. And a week or two before we arrived, uh, they had had just a disastrous uh, raid in Linz, Austria, and I think we lost 10 of our 45 aircraft. And so that we went over as a replacement for that. And they lost them to fighters. About, oh, 70 or 80 German fighters attacked. And uh, so that the number shot down was very, very serious. And the injuries of those that came back, they damaged the aircraft. Was severe. So we went over as a replacement. So when I went over, and I didn't know that at the time, that we were over there because they lost an aircraft, <laughs> that the job was that dangerous. Uh, so that uh, when we went over, and I remember just seeing the aircraft come back, and I said, well, gee, this is the war. These be, the first day we saw the, the planes returning from a mission, and I thought, well, boy, we really are in the war. They're coming back, you know, this is what it is. So, uh, but you fall into the routine, and. Uh, you just do the job, mm -hmm. and uh, we were quite fortunate, and uh, the uh, never being hit by fighters. The Luftwaffe, they had plenty of planes, but by 1944, a lot of their, uh, hundreds of their pilots had been shot down. They couldn't train new pilots quickly enough, the way we could. And so that uh, they had airplanes, but they didn't have the good pilots in 1944. What were some of your main duties? Uh, actually, I was trained as a bombardier, 
as a navigator and a gunner. I went to gunnery school, the same school that uh, the other, the six men who were the non-coms, I went to the same school they went, so I was trained as a gunner. And then while we were in bombardier school, we also had navigation. We had the same navigation as a navigator, except we didn't have celestial. And of course, in combat, we never used celestial. Um, so we were actually were trained in those three different categories. But then when I got into combat, that I didn't use really, I never used any one of the three. All I had to do was <laughs> sit there with I was in the nose of the ship. We have the bomb site, but I, any, uh, unless you're the lead bombardier, you didn't use it. And so, uh, if your pilot is made lead pilot, you become lead bombardier. Well, he didn't become lead pilot, so I was never lead bombardier. Any couple of times that I was uh, on a mission where I was supposed to lead, uh, it was 10 tenths coverage, solid clouds, and then they dropped with a radar, Mickey ship, they called it. So that my duties mostly consisted of uh, hitting a switch. And when I saw the bombs come out of the lead ship, hit a switch and I'd release hours. And close the doors and I was through for the day. <coughs> what was one of your specific missions or one of your one that you remember the most of? Oh, uh, I would say that uh, the one to Vienna. Uh, as, as so that we went to uh, Vienna and Palesti. Uh, we went to, uh, did you ever hear of Palesti, the oil fields in Romania? And okay, so that they wanted, this was a target that uh, we first bombed it from North Africa in 1943, almost a year before we went. Uh, so that they went like in September of 43, and it was a disastrous result. They couldn't go to altitude, it was too long a trip, and uh, over five, almost 500 men were killed that day of air, airmen. And the Germans knew we were coming, the, air, the, uh, the fighters were ready, the aircraft was ready, so it was a disastrous result. So, uh, Palesti was a target which we had gone, the Americans had gone repeatedly to bomb Palesti. And so that we went there twice, and they shot at us a lot. And we went to uh, Vienna, and they shot at us a lot. I mean, just a lot of heavy flak, and uh, other planes going down, but thank God we didn't go down. So, but, and neither, as I say, our ship was never attacked by fighters. Uh, just happened that way, uh, that we'd fly on, say on a Monday, and then you'd, because they had more crews and they had airplanes, you wouldn't fly each time the ship, the group went up. So that they'd get hit by fighters on Tuesday and Wednesday, we'd fly Thursday, and again, no fighters. Just the breaks of the game, you know. I had people praying for me. Was your plane escorted? Pardon? Was your plane escorted by any smaller fighters? Oh, yes. That we had, did you ever hear the Tuskegee Airmen? Oh, yes. Okay. Well, they were our escorts, and of course, you did not have, uh, you had segregations was still prevalent until 1948, I think, when Truman was president, so that we had no colored men in with our squadron at all. If there were colored men, their duties were separate from ours, they, were, they weren't air crew with us. So that, but, and so the, the airmen, they flew P-51s, the red tails. Mm -hmm. And so that these guys are excellent pilots. And so that uh, they would escort us all the way. And that was one of the reasons why we weren't hit by fighters, because the fighters would be scared off, they wouldn't attack if they saw too many fighters to go against them. And they didn't happen. So that the, uh, as I say, the missions to, uh, of course, when you come to the target area, your fighters stay out. They don't have to go through the flak with you. They're up, usually at a greater altitude, circling up, up. They fly faster than a bomber. And so, uh, but those guys are, that was one of the reasons why we had such success, 
in surviving was that uh, the fighters were there to protect us. What was the camaraderie like amongst your crew? Oh, we're very, you're very close buddies. And uh, so that the uh, first pilots shared a perimeter tent where there's six men in a tent big enough to the house. And then the co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier of two crews shared another tent. And then the enlisted men, those six men from each crew had their own tent in another area. And so uh, the uh, we were on, there were, in other words, we were only overseas six months because we went over in, a little over six months, because we went over in July and we returned in January of 45. And uh, during that time, two crews that were our tent mates were, had been shot down. And uh, that if, uh, now we would say, well, we just hope that they'd be prisoners of war if they survive. And uh, actually, I think that both those crews, they might have, most of them survived. Uh, it depend on, if sometimes if, the, uh, the partisans, which group would pick you up, like if you went over to Yugoslavia, there was uh, Mikhailovich and there was Tito, and two different, they were fighting each other as much as they were fighting uh, whose side they were on, Germany. Some of them fought for Germany, some were on the American side, the Allied side. And so, depending upon which group picked you up, whether they would return you or not, and so that of the two crews, they didn't return until uh, the war was over in Europe. And I actually met one of them, quite surprised. I was down in Texas afterward. I went to go through a shower line, and there was a guy that had been shot down. I didn't know you were alive. Yeah. Um, did you ever come in contact with any hostile civilians? No, hostile civilians? Mm -hmm. No. That uh, we were stationed in Italy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really wished I could speak Italian because I could talk to the girls, but I, anyway, <laughs> I couldn't speak any Italian. <clears throat> but the only, no, so that we had very little contact. They'd be there working in the area, they'd prepare our food, and uh, so, and they spoke very little English also. Uh, so that uh, we didn't uh, know hostility you know, of that nature at all. By that time, Italy was on our side. Italy joined our. When do you think Italy joined our side? Give a guess. Forty-three. <laughs> Forty-three. That's right. So that September of forty-three, that uh, we attacked. Uh, we went into Sicily, like in July of forty-three, and then we attacked. Uh, went into uh, Italy in about. September, August, I think September, it landed at Salerno. And uh, so, uh, when, uh, so about that September of 43, in other words, we had landed, after we had landed in Italy, then they said, you know, we've had enough of this, because the poor Italians, they didn't want to go to war anyway, you know. But there were some of them over fighting against the Russians, they were in North Africa. There were thousands that we captured in North Africa. They used to make remarks that said how many acres of uh, troops that they would capture, because they captured uh, like a couple hundred thousand troops of Italians in North Africa. How did you feel about everything that was going on? Uh, that uh, toward the end of the war, I thought I should do a little bit more because I really wasn't doing much, I thought, for the war effort. All I had to do was to ride along and hit the switch. And anybody could hit the switch. After a matter of fact, before the end of the war, they did decrease the crews by down to nine instead of ten, because we just didn't get to use the bomb site. I was trained, took 17 months, all that training, uh, to learn how to use the bomb site and also to navigate and also to use the gun. Well, luckily we didn't need to, I didn't need to use the gun because we weren't hit by fighters. But uh, I was really felt, well, I should 
contribute a bit more. And, uh, but I was staying alive and all I had to after 35 missions, I would get to go home. And if you were, if you weren't on air crew, you, nobody got went home until you're injured or you, uh, or the war ends. And so we we're fortunate in that respect. I say less, a little over six months, that's all we were overseas. So uh, I felt that I should contribute more, you know, like I'd, I'd be a lead bomb race. If I could hit that target, you know, I didn't get the chance. Was the war what you expected? Uh, I think so. I think so, yeah, because uh, we'd seen the movies and we had, you know, read the newspapers and uh, we had, uh, when I was your age, let me see, when I was in eighth grade, we didn't have a, a radio at home, but the teacher in school had a radio and we used to listen to the broadcast, Hitler's broadcast, and he'd be, of course, it'd be in German, and he'd do that staccato, that high-pitched mm -hmm. voice of his, and, and then you would hear just wave after wave of the cheering going on. Well, this was part of the Germans trying to psych the world up, nobody can stop us, you know. And the papers were filled with that kind of information also, said that we have the, our, look at our panzer divisions. And, of course, when did we go into Poland? Germany, you mean? When did Germany go into Poland? 1939. You know what? That's right. All right. So in September, the 1st of September, 39. And so, so this, you take September 39, around to 1940, 39, is a full year. We didn't pass the draft in this country until the, about that time, about August, September of 1940. Then it only passed by one vote because people just said it's their war. We just, you know, it's only been 20 some years since we, our neighbors came back from fighting in World War I. We're not going to go over there again. And so isolationism was so strong in this country that, uh, so 1940 they passed the draft. And then you're drafted for one year. I had a cousin who was drafted in, say, I think about October or November of 1940. And so one year, in other words, one year you're going to be out. All right, so then you come around 1941. So the, the war in Europe was on over two years before America got into it. And so then around December, and of course Pearl Harbor was a terrible thing, but nothing could have united the country the way Pearl Harbor did. Nothing could have shut up those isolationists as fast as Pearl Harbor did. You know, those people who were talking, saying it's their war, even Lindbergh. Remember Lindbergh? Mm -hmm. uh, Lindbergh crossed the first man to fly the ocean by himself in oh. 1927. So that Lindbergh went over and he was so impressed by the German Air Force. He said, they got a terrific Air Force. They can't, nobody can stop. Them. They got the best fighters, they're much better than ours. And so Lindbergh was talking up, no, don't go to war against them. He shut up, you know? And there was Senator Bora, who was a great isolationist. He shut up after Pearl Harbor and so That was an important, important thing in our history. Sad that we lost those, all those sailors, those men that we did at Pearl Harbor, but it united the country like nothing else could. How did you feel when you received word that you were being sent home? Uh, well, we were, we felt the war was winding down for months. I came back from overseas in, in January of 1945. When did the war in Europe end? 45. In when? 45. Yeah, May 8th. Okay. So, and uh, so the war ended. We felt that the war, uh, do you remember the Battle of the Bulge? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the Battle of the Bulge was our only setback. We thought we were just going to keep walking right into Berlin when we were over there in the fall of 44. And then in December the 16th of 44, when the Battle of the Bulge, and that for about a month, 
things were just terrible, you know, our casualties were wicked, that the winter was terrible. And so, uh, we have this, but after the Battle of the Balls, then we felt it's just a matter of time. So that as we come down to the war in Europe is over, and then uh, the war in the, in the Pacific was going well. We had gotten the Pacific, we, MacArthur had captured uh, the Philippines by about, we went back in there in October of 45, 44, and it took us quite a while, around till March, and we really didn't have them all cleared out till almost around June. So we felt the war was really wind, you know, pretty much over, just a matter of time. And then uh, when the bomb was dropped, uh, the first one was on August 6th, and uh, the second one on August 9th. And so it was uh, when so that September then the war ended. I, I got discharged that following November. So it was just a matter of time. You know, I was just marking time. Uh, actually, I was working uh, down in Texas. And when I was just filling the time, I had no duties. I went into pilot training afterward. In order to, remember I told you that we go to, uh, after I went to Gettysburg for a college training detachment. I went to Nashville for classification, and so I didn't qualify for a pilot or navigator, I qualified for bombardier. And my main objective was I wanted to be an officer, so that I really wasn't all that bummed about not making pilot, you know. The guy said, oh, look at all, you're short, you make a good fighter pilot. <laughs> anyway, or the, or the ball turret man, you make good ball turret man, you fit in there easy, you know. And uh, so, but, so I went through the classification. This time I qualified for pot. But, and I had a great time. I was out in California. And this would be in uh, early spring of 45. But and then I washed out. Luckily I had to kill myself because I just didn't have the knack for it, you know. I dragged a wing. <laughs> I couldn't keep that nose on a point. <laughs> Anyhow, but I loved it. So, but then after that I was just kind of marking time. Did you receive any medals? Or commendations? Uh, just the routine. In other words, if you survive the first five missions, you get an air medal. Uh -huh. And if you, uh, then for every ten mission after that, you get an oak leaf cluster. So each of us earned the air medal and three oak leaf clusters because we had 35 missions. And that, I tell you how come we had, I had to fly 35 missions? Mm -hmm. The 8th Air Force was out of England. And the casualties in 1943 were just off. Uh, so that you, we didn't start flying many missions. The British would fly at night because they said it's too dangerous for the fighters to strike them in the daytime. But we said, well, we got the Norden bomb site and uh, we'll fly in the daytime. We got uh, 10 positions for guns and we'll protect ourselves against the fighters with our guns. And so, uh, when, uh, so that, as so I say, uh, in 43, in the beginning of 44, that we lost a lot of, a lot of crews, as a matter of fact, about 20% losses. And one guy said, you know, 20%, that means after five missions, you're 100% dead, you know? So that, they said, well, if you, they said, if you guys can survive, uh, 25 missions, then you can go home. And in the 15th Air Force, it was 35 missions if we go home. But anybody else in the war, if you're on the ground, an infantryman in Italy, you're just there. And it was miserable, you know. So that's some tough ways to spend the war. Tough ways. What was it like returning home after the war? It was, uh, yeah, it was a fun time. Was, I had money, <laughs> you know, and uh, I went back to college. And so, uh, that the thing about the difference, we say, between the Second World War and Vietnam or even the Korean War is that everybody was in it. And the papers were filled with it, that everybody either had 
a, a son or a husband uh, or someone in the war or you had a neighbor in the war and so that uh, you were very much into it. Everybody was very united in that respect. Uh, much unlike the Vietnam or Korean War when the heart of the country wasn't with them. So, uh, coming back though, I went back to college and uh, so uh, it was, uh, and we had the GI Bill. What a wonderful thing. Everybody got the GI Bill except the WAPs. Did you ever hear about the WAPs? The Women's Air Force. Those ladies who used to, they'd ferry aircraft when you produce it, like B-24s made out in Detroit, mm -hmm. to fly them from there to the air base, somebody had to do that. Well, if you got someone that uh, you're not going to have a woman flying in combat so she could ferry the aircraft and the other guy could go in combat. And so there were hundreds or thousands of women who did a great service. But then as the war wound down and pilots were coming back from combat, they said, okay, you girls, go. We don't need you. And so very unfairly, they didn't give them the GI Bill, they didn't give them the recognition, so that the women got a, a short shift on that part. But uh, we had the GI Bill, which was such a blessing. It was such a blessing. Are you glad or upset about having enlisted in there? Oh, no. The Air Force has been very good to me. Uh, and I stayed in reserves. I used to come up here at Griffiths Air Base for my two weeks. And, uh, oh, I would, I, I taught school for 40 years, chemistry and physics. Are you taking physics this year? Mm, I took it last year. Took it last year? Did you take chemistry? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take, my mom is a chemistry teacher. Oh, really? In Brazil. In, here in Rome? In Brazil. Oh, is that right? Yep. And so, uh, I enjoyed it. I liked teaching. And I went to, became a, went to Plattsburgh and got my degree there and then to Syracuse for the master. So uh, I enjoyed teaching about 40 years, you know. Would you do it all again? Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. And when, uh, as I say, even now I draw a pension because I stayed in reserve and from age 60 on you draw a pension, which is about equivalent to Social Security. So it makes a big difference today. And, uh, so that you felt the big thing I thought I was I was part of the you know on the varsity when I was in high school I never played any sport or you know <laughs> lived out in the country and so forth but here I felt when I was on the air crew that you were on the varsity that's why I wasn't broken hearted about not making a pilot you know at least I was flying there and then as I say and staying in reserves I used to either teach in the reserves or I would um, when I'd come to Griffiths here, I wouldn't, uh, they had, of course, no training or refreshers, bombardier or navigator, so I was reclassified as an armament officer, and I worked with them here on that. Not much work, really. So it was, uh, the reserves were a good deal for me. We even got paid part of the time. For your active duty, you get paid. And sometimes you get paid for a meeting, but at other times, you just had a, uh, you could take correspondence work to get your points per year to stay with the uh, reserve program. We're, I'm taking too long. Yep. No, that's you sure? that's all my questions. Is so, that it? Yep. All right. If that's so, do you, if you have any questions? All right. Uh, now is he, is Mr. Ford, in his class? Yep. It's our class period right now, actually. So if you want to go, if you would like to go and talk to the class period, sure. He doesn't okay. mind being. Uh, yeah. Let's see okay. what he's got scheduled. And. Uh,